Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Backyard Ecology Workshop, where we will be looking at changing the way we garden. We know how vital ecosystems are to our own survival and the numerous other species that inhabit the planet with us. It is more important than ever that we support them, and tonight's presentations are going to help you support nature and build a healthier community. It's important we acknowledge our event tonight is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Quiquitlam First Nation. We thank the Quiquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them along with the waters and all that is above and below. This event is brought to you through a partnership between Burke Mountain Naturalists and the Wonders Tree Fellowship. After the presentations, we invite you to visit the display booths in the foyer to learn more about these groups. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Nancy Furness, who is a dear friend and a hard-working community builder. Nancy is full of great ideas and bottomless energy. She has a background in plant ecophysiology and is a longtime community advocate for a healthy environment. Nancy is also a member of the Burke Mountain Naturalists and a founding member of the Wondrous Tree Fellowship. She will start us off with a brief look into why we need to shift common gardening practices to embrace a more ecologically friendly approach. Nancy? Thank you so much, Laura, for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. It's so wonderful to see a full room of people here ready to look at ecological gardening. So tonight, I'm just going to start off um, looking at the way we garden now and some of the reasons why we do what we do. So I think if you um, took a look around the Tri-Cities, that you would probably agree that a lot of our urban landscape and residential landscaping is in lawns. So we're going to take a look into how that happens. And it turns out that if you have a Western European background, then you actually have a really long history with lawns and yards. So we'll have to go all the way back to medieval times. Um, and back around 500 AD in the Middle Ages, sometimes we call it the Dark Ages, when there were small settlements, there were started to see these enclosures in front of homes where people kept their domestic livestock and did, you know, sort of family things. And it kind of made sense at the time. And that was different than the open fields that surrounded them, so it gave a little bit of security and definition to the, the family unit. About, if we move forward, about a thousand years, we're at the end of the Middle Ages. Um, it was very common for medieval castles in Britain and England to have these grassy expanses around them. And again, it kind of made sense, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, the kind of um, areas where this was happening, there were grassy sort of expanses happening anyways. It was just part of the environment. And the other thing is that these castles were guarded, so you had to watch out for your enemy. And it's really hard to sneak across a wide open expanse of grass, right? So again, it made sense to have grass in these situations. And then, if we carry on into more of the Renaissance times, you know, 1600s, um, it became a time when wealthy landowners, again, British and French mostly, were saying, hmm, you know, I've got so much land, I don't need it all to grow food. So they put some of it into gardens and, and lawns, and, you know, they could hire people, and there was this attitude of taking um, dominion over nature a little bit. And so it turned out that um, it was a really good way to say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, and I've got status. So it was a little bit of a status symbol. And then when Western um, European settlers came over to North America, they brought that love of the um, lawns and yards with them. So when they came over, um, homesteaders were having like, you know, yards that had dirt in them and heaven forbid they were growing vegetables in their front yards and all kinds of things like this. 
So there was one man in particular, his name was Frederick Law Olmsted. He's the, um, considered like the, the father of um, North American landscape architecture. And he had a very different vision. He, his vision was more like we have homes and then just this grassy carpet of green flowing from house to house and everybody would live happily in this kind of you know, environment. And it would be each person's, each homeowner's responsibility, their civic duty, to look after that patch of lawn in front of their own home. So to have a neatly kept lawn would be a, remar a mark of respectability. And then he wove this whole idea into democracy, and it became firmly entrenched as part of like the American dream. You have your house, you have your yard, your nice green grass. Then... If you move forward to today, um, we're still kind of doing the same thing, right? So all the way from medieval times up to today, I think you wouldn't be too surprised if you went into a backyard anywhere in the Tri-Cities and saw something like this. So a fairly nicely kept green lawn. It's, you know, manicure, maybe not manicure, but it's mowed. Um, you have a nice border of colorful annual flowers. Uh, perhaps a, a patio to sit out where you could look over your well-ordered yard. And it looks nice, and it's something that we've done for many, many years. But I want to take a few minutes and just sort of deconstruct what we're actually seeing here. So we'll look at the lawn, we'll look at those flowers, look at that patio, and look at the neatness and orderliness that we see there. So... Anybody who's ever had a lawn knows that it doesn't just happen, right? It takes a lot of work. The first thing that you might be doing is mowing your lawn. Um, and the Government of Canada recently did a study that showed that one hour of mowing your lawn with one of these big gas mowers is, creates the same amount of pollution as if you drove a newer model car from Vancouver somewhere past Salmon Arm. So it's pretty shocking, right? Like, one hour of mowing your lawn or drive your car from Vancouver to past Salmon Arm. These um, two-stroke motors engines are, are really inefficient and really polluting. So, oh, and one other thing. There was a study in the U.S. that said that 5% of the air pollution in the U.S. is caused by lawnmowers and leaf blowers, which is a huge amount. So we can step back and start using electric mowers and maybe, you know, hand mowing and stuff that um, maybe alleviate the problem a little bit. So the next thing you do after you mow your lawn, you're going to remove those clippings, right? And then it, um, it creates a system where you're taking resources out. So you have to put them back in. And quite often that is done through the addition of some synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen. And the problem with that is that about half the nitrogen that generally gets applied to lawns doesn't get used by the lawn. It goes into the soil, it's broken down by microbes, and it's converted into nitro nitrogen oxide. Um, and that is volatile, so it goes back up into the atmosphere. And for all the cool hoods people here tonight, um, that nitrogen oxide has 300 times the heat-carrying capacity of carbon dioxide. So you can very quickly turn your lawn into a little bit of a carbon sink, into something that's really you know, helping to heat up our atmosphere. The other thing that we sometimes see is um, application of pesticides and insecticides onto lawns. And in Coquitlam, um, they're ahead of the curve because I think it was 2012, uh, the use of cosmetic pesticides was banned. So, good one for Coquitlam there. Okay, so now, of course, you have to water that lawn, right? Keep it nice and green. And again, a study was done showing that 30% of residential water use goes for landscape uses. And a huge proportion of that goes to keeping the lawns green. And now, with our hotter, drier, longer summers, we see water restrictions coming into play, and they're coming in earlier, staying longer. And so the new norm going forward may not be these lovely green lawns anymore. We might be looking at brown lawns, and I think we call them golden to try and make them sound <laughs> a little bit prettier. 
And then the, the very nature of the lawn, um, the goal quite often is to grow one species. So we don't want any weeds, we don't want any other species in there. So it's basically a monoculture. Um, the monoculture, the species that is chosen, is not friendly to pollinators. There's nothing there for pollinators. So if we have fewer pollinators, we have fewer, less food for birds, less food for small mammals, it just kind of affects the whole food web there. The other thing is that monocultures are more prone to disease, um, to invasive species, and to insect outbreaks. So you have a much more resilient system if you have a variety of different plants instead of just one. Okay, so how many of you have seen lawn like this? Okay, I'm going to ask that a little different. How many of you have not seen lawn like this? <laughs> Okay, it's very rare. <laughs> um, so it, everyone is pretty familiar with this issue. And this is just an example of an invasive pest coming in. So European uh, shaker beetles, the adults live underground, and then sometime in June, they're going to come out, they'll swarm, they'll have a big mating frenzy, and then before the sun comes up, they'll all head back underground again. And they'll lay eggs, and then several weeks later, you get these larvae emerging. And the larvae will feed on the roots of, of the turf grass. So you might see brown patches in your lawn, and you might also feel like the lawn's a little spongy if you have a lot of these. But the real damage comes when those black birds, the crows, yeah, they come and they start pulling everything up, and the skunks and the raccoons, and then you get this mounded, lumpy lawn. And at that point, there's not a whole lot you can do. But the good news is that maybe that's the point where you say, hmm, maybe I'm going to ditch the lawn and go for a more resilient kind of um, ground cover. So that could be seen as a big opportunity. And I, you know, I've been bashing lawns a little bit, right? But I don't want to say turf the turf entirely because there are some cases where I think lawn and grass really make sense. And it, you know, it might even be in your backyards. But I think one of the places where lawn does make sense is in our public um, parks. So what better surface to lie out on on a nice sunny afternoon than grass? And hopefully you'll be lying under some of these big, big trees, but we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> we'll save that one. So the flowers in the garden, if you have annual flowers, um, it's just such an easy way to add a big splash of color, right? I think we, I, I know I've done it many times, um, but there's another side to annuals. So the first thing is, of course you have to plant them every year. And when you do that, you're disturbing the soil, you're disturbing that ecosystem, um, you are working and maybe walking on the soil, compacting it, you know, altering the structure and making it a, a less hospitable environment. There's a cost. You have to go and buy those things every year. And it's really getting expensive to fill up a whole bed with annuals. It's not cheap anymore. There is a carbon footprint that's associated with them. Um, very often they're grown in glass houses or greenhouses. There's artificial light, supplemental heat. They're put into plugs and trays and pots, plastic, lots of plastic, and then they're uh, transported everywhere to retail outlets on trucks. So that's a fairly hefty carbon footprint. The other thing is um, when we select for these annuals, one of the things you're looking for are big, big flowers. So quite often it's the double and the triple petaled varieties that are selected. And when that happens, a plant only has so much resources to go around. So it may mean that there are less resources going into the pollen and nectar producing parts of the plant. Not good for the pollinator. The other thing is, if you were just a teeny tiny little pollinator, how would you find your way through all those petals, right? <laughs> like that's a, a, a lot of work to get into that flower. Um, the other thing that we may not even be aware of is these plants are subjected to different treatments. Quite often there's plant growth regulators and there's a whole cocktail of different chemicals, insecticides and different things. You won't know that when you buy the plants. That's not, that doesn't come along with the plants. So we're going to 
share with you tonight a whole bunch of really good alternatives to these sort of old-time favorites. Okay, that um, concrete patio. So impermeable surfaces like asphalt and concrete and, you know, the traditional concrete pavers and stuff, they soak up the heat. They also don't allow water to percolate down, so you get water running straight off, sometimes straight into the drains, and other times it might pool and puddle and you get stagnant puddles in your backyard, which is not great either. And I don't know how many of you are in the same situation as I'm in. When we bought our house, that concrete patio came with the house, right? It was already there. And I'm not ready to go out and maybe break it up and take it out at this point. But when I am, I will be looking at one of the more permeable surfaces that are available. There's lots of them. Um, they allow that water to percolate down. It gets filtered and goes back in to replenish the um, the groundwater, and it also will keep your lawn or your backyard much cooler. So something more to think about there. And then that last component of that yard, do you remember how neat and tidy it was? There wasn't one single leaf or twig there. And I know Jane isn't with us tonight, but that picture is for her. She has to think about um, <laughs> leaf flowers. Anyways, so it turns out that leaves are not actually litter, and that it's okay to leave the leaves. So we can see many beneficial insects and pollinators, including bumblebees, that will overwinter underneath that um, layer of leaf litter. So it's important to leave those leaves. You can leave them in garden beds, and they'll break down into nutrient-rich organic matter. Um, they'll serve to kind of insulate the plant roots from harsh um, weather in the winter. And they also help to conserve water when you have a leaf mulch over the garden beds. Okay, so uh, just a couple of things. We have to talk about some trends we're seeing in the Tri-Cities. The first one is synthetic turf. Um, how many of you have seen this popping up in your neighborhoods? Yeah, me too. I see more of it every year. And there is, you might have heard sort of the environmental argument for artificial turf. And it goes something like this. Um, you don't need fertilizers or pesticides. True. Uh, it conserves water because you're not going to water it, right? And of course, you're definitely not going to be mowing it. So it sounds good. But if we step back and look at the bigger picture, the downside outweighs those benefits by far. And we can show you how to you know, do all those things without using artificial turf. So some of the things is that artificial turf is a huge heat absorber. So it's going to heat up your yard. Um, when you put that down, you're making less space for living plants that could actually be providing some benefits. And it creates these sort of, we call them ecological dead zones. And we're seeing a patchwork of them popping up across the Tri-Cities. So you might have pollinating insects that are in one area, but they're not able to get across these sort of ecological deserts. And that's a problem. There's a large carbon footprint associated with synthetic turf. A lot of this stuff is uh, manufactured in Asia and some in the southern US. It's made with a whole lot of petrochemicals and it's then put on vessels or on trucks and it's shipped around the world. So that's, that's a lot right there. And then it may have permeability issues. It doesn't always drain well. You can get um, you know, localized flooding or some surface runoff. And um, also, you know, there's a hygiene problem maybe because it doesn't have that natural filtering ability that vegetation does. So if you have a dog, for instance, you might have to be washing that artificial turf off. There's potential contaminants. It's made out of all sorts of chemicals. And one of the issues is little bits of plastic can break off and move down through the soil and get into the water, um, groundwater. And then you're going to have to replace it. It doesn't last forever. And when you go to recycle it, uh, it's only recyclable at specialty plants. And they, it has to undergo this really harsh chemical process. And it has to all be broken down into the various layers and stuff. 
I tried to look up somewhere in the Tri-Cities where you could recycle this. And maybe I missed it, but the closest place I could find was Southern California. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Load your synthetic turf on a truck and truck it down to Southern California to have it recycled? Um, I'm afraid that it will probably end up either in the landfill or being incinerated, neither of which is really a, a great option. The other thing that I think is, you know, it sounds small, but to me it's huge, is that you lose that whole tactile experience. You lose just that tiny little bit more of a connection with nature. It's kind of like sending the kids outside to play on a carpet or something, you know? It's, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> the other trend is rocks. And, you know, rocks have a, a really important um, place in landscape and, and you know there's places where we want to see rocks and rocks work but what I'm talking about is when you see a whole sea of rocks like the whole you know huge front yard full of rocks they absorb heat so once again you're heating up the whole you know contributing to the urban heat island and this all this heat can and weight can stress the plants um, hopefully, hopefully there are plants somewhere, um, but it can make them more susceptible to disease um, and to plant pests. So, uh, you know, it's basically a desert. There's, it doesn't support pollinators, um, and there's no wildlife that's going to go on there. And the other thing is, at some point, those weeds are going to grow through because that's what weeds do, right? So you're going to have to deal with them at some point. And I just want to take a second to say. What I'm saying here isn't hard edges. Um, you know, there is a place for all of this. And what I'm, the point we're trying to make is maybe blur the edges a little bit. And it's time to step back and see how we can, you know, pull back from having all lawn or all rocks and, and start to um, look at nature and start to invite pollinators and beneficial insects and birds and small mammals back into our gardens and our backyards. You know, we can do that. And I think um, one of the things that we can do is something called ecological gardening, where we start to go back and look at the processes and the patterns that are already fine-tuned in nature. And so when you do something, think, what would nature do? and then apply that to your own backyard. And when you do that, you'll automatically start to reduce those external inputs that you need. And you'll automatically increase biodiversity and the resilience and the health of your own yard. So each one of you should have in your hands a sheet of paper, I'm hoping. Um, and on one side, it's got a whole bunch of, it's got some categories and then a whole bunch of uh, points on it. So I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room could add more points, right? But what we're hoping you'll do is use this sheet of paper to um, jot down some notes because you're going to hear some really awesome information, lots of information tonight. If there's something you think you can use in your own garden, just make a little note. On the other side of the sheet, it's got all the pollinator plants and all the plants that will be talked about tonight. They're in order of how they appear, just like in the movies. Um, but, you know, take a look at those, and um, we really hope that you can use those. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker for tonight. So James Bobbitt is a certified Red Seal horticulturist. He's got a, um, a deep knowledge of horticulture and also um, extensive hands-on gardening experience. And he's able to take that knowledge and apply it to create these amazing, ecologically resilient gardens. And so James is a member of Burke Mountain Naturalist. He's also a founding member of Wondrous Tree Fellowship. And there's just one more slide I want to show you before I pass it over to James. Okay, this is James. <laughs> So a little while ago, we were at Van Dusen talking about you know, what we were going to talk about tonight and looking for plants, and James said, oh, I think people you know, would really like to know about this particular plant, but we couldn't find a tag. So I turned around and there he is. So my point is that there's no limit 
to the trouble that James will go to to get you the good information that you need in order to be a successful ecological gardener. So please join me in welcoming James Thank you. Well, thank you, Nancy, for that uh, very flattering picture. <laughs> we appreciate that. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What's the real reason that he was actually, you know, looked like he was hiding there? And I can promise you it was not because I was hiding from an ex-partner, okay? It's, it's, it's not what it was. But you know you're a plant nerd for sure when you dive headfirst into a shrub to find a plant label. Um, that's definitely me for sure. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, that familiar with ecological gardening or naturescaping, um, it's another way we like to put it, I think there's going to be some good material in here for you. I, at least I hope there is. I hope there's something that you, know, you, can, you can get out of this. And, and, and for those of you, and I know there's probably a lot of very avid gardeners here, a lot of, a lot of people who are already very nature-friendly gardening people here, and, of course, the Burke Mountain Naturalist folks are here as well, and, and their knowledge is second to none as far as uh, the environment goes. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm going to show, you know, you may already know, but my hope is that there might just be a few things that maybe you haven't thought about before, maybe a few things you haven't seen, and I'm hoping that it can just spark a little bit of, of uh, creativity uh, and to encourage everybody to just step outside of the, of the gardening box, so to speak. Okay, let's get started. Right. Right, so a much younger James here uh, in this picture here. And uh, I have to admit, I have to confess, I was very obsessed with exotic plants back in the day when I first started. And I, I'm sure a lot of gardeners out there can relate to this. Um, the, the more rare, the more unusual, the more different it was, the more I wanted to put it in my garden, the more I wanted to see if I could cultivate that, see if I could grow that kind of plant. And here is a spectacular plant, and I, I still love this plant. Uh, it's a uh, Cardiocrinum giganteum. It's a giant Himalayan lily. Uh, beautiful plant, uh, but of course it is an exotic plant, uh, all the way from the Himalayas, from China. So um, I'm sure you can all relate to this, you know, this temptation. You go into a uh, retail gardening store, and your senses are just bombarded by all these colors, all these smells, these textures, the latest cultivars. And you've got a salesperson there who's showing you a Zone 9 plant, convincing you that you have the skills to take this home and plant it. It's going to survive. Uh, and, of course, that experience is usually it doesn't. Um, it, it usually doesn't. But in this garden here, it's my old garden in Coquitlam. I had tree ferns. I had all kinds of things. And eventually it ended up mostly in disappointment. Um, I was able to keep growing these, but I lost my tree fern. Uh, so the exotics, um, you know, there's some real problems that come along um, with those. For sure. So this is a garden that kind of reflects that. It reflects that obsession with, uh, with exotic plants. And although I think it, it's a pretty nice looking uh, garden bed, I was, I was pretty proud of this when I, when I did this. But this was about 20 years ago when I first started working for the city of Port Coquitlam. And it basically essentially is an annual bed. It's a summer annual bed. And at first blush, you know, you look at this and you think, okay, well, you know, it's from a design, design perspective. It's got... You know, it's got some nice bold foliage, it contrasts with the finer foliage, so it doesn't look too bad. It's got some nice contrasting colors here. Uh, you know, it's a nice layering effect here, so it looks not too bad. But on closer inspection, as you look at this a little closer, you know, of course, you notice that there's taro plants in there, there's banana plants, um, there's all kinds of exotic plants, subtropical plants, um, um, to be exact. And, of course, look at the summers that we're having now. And all these plants take a huge amount of water just to look like this. So we're watering these all the time. Sometimes every other day we would be out there watering this garden. Of course, it's, they're heavy feeders as well, so they take a lot of fertilizer. You know, and like Nancy was saying, the same with annual beds, you know, you've got to turn the soil and fertilize it, plant up your, your plants. And then, of course, in the fall, you know, you've got to remove all these plants, pack them back in the truck, take them, take them over to the nursery, store them in the nursery where you're using carbon, of course, to heat the nursery all winter long just to keep them alive. So, really not that environmentally friendly a garden, although it looks like it might be, but it's really, really not, actually, think about it. And so as I, as I evolved as a gardener and an environmentalist, I began to realize that gardens need to be more than just beautiful spaces. They need to provide habitat. We need to, to provide forage. We need to provide shelter to all these beautiful little animals that we share this earth with. We owe them something. 
And uh, I think um, I think that's why that's exactly why we're here, ecological gardening. Right? Not only are we in a climate crisis, but of course we are also in a bio biodiversity crisis. And we need to look no further, of course, than our native bee populations. There are approximately 4,000 native bees in North America. Half of those are now in decline. And 25% of them are at risk of extinction. And considering that one third of all the food that we eat is made possible by these industrious little insects, you know, poll pollinating, uh, pollinating our orchards, and our agricultural crops, I think we should be very concerned about this. Absolutely. But of course, it's not just the pollinators that are in trouble. Uh, insects around the world are in decline. 45% 40, decline in insect populations over the past four decades. Um, you know, that's absolutely shocking. Thanks. And we have here, of course, in the corner, the iconic uh, monarch butterfly. And uh, Nancy, I'm very jealous because she just did a trip to Mexico to actually see the overwintering monarchs. Um, spectacular. And she said it was just amazing. Um, it was, and it was, it was, it was a, a bucket list kind of, kind of trip to do. But sadly, the return of the monarchs, this, we, we, we know, for those of you who don't know, they, they, they go all the way, they migrate all the way from Ontario all the way to the, to the mountainous areas of Mexico to overwinter. And this year was one of the lowest returns that they've seen in, uh, in the past decade, which is really sad. And it may be the, one of the lowest returns they've ever seen. So we know that also the monarchs are in trouble there. And this little beetle over there in the corner, um, uh, this is a 10-lined June bug, or June beetle. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with this beetle, but when, when I was a kid growing up in Richmond, I remember every summer these, these big beetles, they're quite large, they would just sort of magically appear. Um, and, and as a kid, I was absolutely you know, enchanted by these, these great big beetles because as soon as you went to touch them or you, you, you put your finger there, they would actually hiss at you. They could make this hissing noise, which I thought was just fabulous, right? And so when you think about it, it's these kind of interactions, these childhood interactions with nature, you know, that, that can really spark a, a, a child's imagination and want to learn more about our natural world. So these are really important moments in a child's life. Sadly for me, I haven't seen one of these in about 30 years. And uh, I don't know if anyone else has recently, but I just don't see them any longer. And you know, it is considered to be an agricultural pest, but yet it's also a native beetle. It's native to Western North America, and it belongs here. Um, you know, but it's very sad that we no longer see them. Okay. So, of course, when we lose our insects, we lose a lot of other things too. We know that they are at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, it's, it's very important. Of course, we're going to see less frogs, you know, less toads salamanders, newts, all those sorts of things. All the amphibians are going to be struggling if we have no insects or less insects. Garter snakes, of course, you don't see that many of them in our gardens anymore. Um, mammals of all kinds, you know, whether it be shrews or, or skunks or raccoons, they all rely on insects as well. And maybe most amazingly enough of all of it is this little brown bat in the corner here. And from what I understand is the little brown bats can eat up to a thousand uh, uh, mosquito-sized insects in one night, and, uh, and I don't know if uh, I don't know if the Burke Mountain Naturalist folks, uh, maybe John Saremba is here. I don't know. He's he's one of our bat specialists. Oh, his wife is here, um, and I read somewhere that a, a nursing female brown little brown bat can eat as many as uh, can eat over four thousand insects in one night. Um, astonishing. So, uh, and we know our bat populations are in trouble too. Okay. Um, Birds, 96% of terrestrial birds rely on insects, especially when they're feeding their young. Very important food source necessary for them to raise their young. And that includes hummingbirds too. You know, we sometimes think that hummingbirds only uh, drink nectar, but of course they, they eat a lot of small insects as well. Fungus gnats, aphids, uh, small spiders and mosquitoes as well. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's a struggle as well. Of course, we know the causes of... Uh, of the declines, it's no great secret really, climate change, pesticide use, and of course loss of habitat. Now while climate change is a pretty big issue, and uh, at this point it's going to be a, a long-term proposition to try and turn that around, um, I hope that we can for sure, but when you look at pesticide use, and Nancy touched on this, I think she covered this fairly well, that's something we can do today. We can stop using pesticides tomorrow. If you're still using cosmetic pesticides out there on your front lawn, your back lawn, or your garden spaces, we need to stop. 
Now, I know that there's some folks from the city, uh, maybe the city of Coquitlam here, and I understand that there are times when, you know, we've, you know, we have Japanese knotweed. There are certain invasive weeds that, that you know, we have to spot treat with uh, Roundup occasionally. It's one of the few ways we can actually get rid of them. Um, but for us, uh, really, as gardeners at home, um, there's no reason to be using pesticides at all. Um, so that's my spiel on pesticide use. Habitat loss, oh, sorry, one more, Brian. Habitat loss, of course, is a big one as well. Uh, you know, encroaching urbanization uh, is slowly chipping away at our native forests. We're losing, you know, losing a lot of habitat that way. Uh, forest fires, you know, we, we're losing huge amounts of habitat through forest fires. And that's, that's very, uh, a very scary thing as well. But again, habitat loss in our urban environments, again, that's something we can start changing tomorrow. We can start planting more ecologically friendly plants. And in our city parks, we can be doing this a lot more. Um, um, there's pollinator corridors that I know some cities are working on. Um, our community gardens, you know, we can be more ecologically friendly there. And of course, we can do a lot in our own, in our own backyards. But it's going to take a little bit of a readjustment on what we think, our, percep our perception of what a beautiful garden is or what a natural or healthy garden is. And very much, uh, very unlike the ones that Nancy was showing earlier on, this garden here, um, I love this little garden, it's great. This is how nature would garden, I think. Just being a little messy, letting things just kind of do their own thing. Um, these are all native plants that are planted in this little garden. So you're going to have, naturally, it's going to be great for insect life, it's going to be great for bird life. And, and more importantly, um, at the end of the season, I have the feeling that this gardener, whoever this person is, is going to leave all these perennials and not cut them back and not just chop them down every, every fall like, like most of us do. Um, and I can tell there already that this, this little uh, plant in the foreground here has not been deadheaded, and I think that's really good because there's seeds. There's, there's, there's seeds for birds there from, from these kind of plants as well. Uh, but it's really important because um, we have something very important in that uh, next slide here. We have stem nesting bees. And these little guys, of course, will overwinter in stems and hollowed out stems, so large perennials, uh, some, of the, some shrubs as well, like raspberry canes. And they'll do a little hole into the side of that stem and they can overwinter. So if we're too eager to chop back our gardens in the fall and get rid of everything, clean it up like we, like we are sort of conditioned to do, we could, be, we could be getting rid of all these beautiful little bees and not even really knowing it. So if we can wait and hold off until the springtime, uh, usually native bees start coming out at around 12 degrees Celsius. If we get that sort of continual temperature through the daytimes, you know, you'll see the bumblebee queens coming out. You'll see some of our native bees starting to, starting to buzz around and come out of hibernation as well. So we need to wait if we can. And I know this is very tough uh, for a lot of the city gardeners, professional gardeners, because the, the public has an expectation and they want to see everything trimmed down. They will see, see everything cleaned up. Um, really quickly. So in that case, I'm thinking, if you can identify at least the, the, the perennials that you have or the shrubs that you have that have these hollow, hollow stems in them, wait as long as we can into the springtime, then when we do cut them back, we, we want to cut them back anywhere from about 10 inches to 24 inches in height. And that's because these open stems here are going to be the perfect nesting place for these bees. So, they're gonna, so they, they mostly nest in the old dead wood that's been cut for that, that previous season. So it's very important that we don't take them down to the ground, that we leave them much higher up, and with any luck, you might get a stem nesting bee, which would be terrific. Of course, one of the easy things we can do, and a lot of people know about this, but it's just leaving, uh, finding a little corner of your garden to leave a pile of branches. You know, a pile of branches, some leaves, some moss, you know, it's a fantastic place for, uh, for uh, queen bumblebees to overwinter. And like Nancy was saying, they'll just dig down into that first little surface layer of soil, under some leaves perhaps, and this is a perfect kind of environment for, for them to do that. So uh, this is a neighbor who uh, I, I just saw this in the neighborhood. And I don't know if they really intended this or not, but I'm glad that they did because I think it's really valuable habitat. And there's a queen, of course, starting her brood, just kind of starting off and uh, starting her little nest. Uh, having some tolerance in the garden, I think, is also really important. And uh, here we have um, what some people would consider as a pest, believe it or not. It's a leaf cutter bee. Uh, making a round circle there, and uh, what these leafcutter bees will do is they will cut a perfectly round circle. It's quite amazing. It's quite beautiful. They will roll that up, and then they will actually stuff it into a little piece of uh, rotting wood that they've already made a hole into, or they've drilled a little tunnel into. They'll put that little leaf in there. 
They'll take a little pollen pouch, a little pollen pad that they've collected from our flowers, stuff it in there for their, for their babies, for their eggs, lay an egg on top of that, and of course when the egg hatches and the larva begins to feed on the pollen. So it's, uh, it's an amazing little creature, but they can do a real number on your leaves if you happen to have them in your garden. It's, it's, quite, a, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a shock to see what they've done to this leaf. But I, for one, would be honored to have this one in my garden. I would love to see the leaf damaged because I'd be pretty happy to see a leaf cutter bee. That would be fantastic. And, uh, of course, you know, one of the good guys here are the ladybugs, um, you know, eating an aphid. And, again, if we can tolerate having some pests in our gardens, you know, some aphids, and, and maybe not be too quick to grab the uh, safer soap or to uh, eliminate all the harmful insects, you know, they do a little damage, and true, if aphids get out of control, they can do a lot of damage. But, you know, if you have aphids, you can almost guarantee that very soon after that, ladybugs will show up, and they'll be, lacewings will show up, and they'll start eating those aphids and taking care of them. If they get really bad, just take a, take a hose and just spray them off. You know, you don't always have to go, again, to a, to a pesticide, um, and if that doesn't work, maybe a little spray of safer soap is okay as well. It's not, not terribly harmful if you're spot spraying it on, on aphids. Okay. Uh, leave the leaves. Nan Nancy touched on this already. Um, I think leaves are, uh, you know, they're nature's gift to gardeners. Uh, they really do so much for us. As a, uh, as a top dressing, as a, as a ground cover, um, uh, or a mulch, I should say, they actually will protect the soil, of course. Um, in the summertime, they will keep moisture into the soil. And uh, in the wintertime, they sort of, and of course, keeps the soil cool in the summer. In the wintertime, it does the reverse. It's just like insulation. It actually keeps your soil warm. It actually keeps the roots of tender plants warm as well. So it's a little protection for your, for your tender plants to put around there, for sure. And of course, as we know, as leaf matter breaks down, it starts feeding the soil. All right? So it's feeding the soil, creating that humus layer that we really want because we know that our soils are just full of life, teeming with uh, microorganisms, um, bacteria and fungi and all kinds of great stuff. And when we leave our leaves on the soil, we are enriching our soil. We're feeding all those microbes as well. Of course, it also protects the soil uh, as well from, uh, from, from, from damage and from uh, uh, erosion as well. So that's another thing it does. And of course, it's home to all kinds of great insects. And this beetle here is a ground beetle. It's a voracious predator. And it'll come out at nighttime and it'll eat all kinds of slugs and aphids and all sorts of other pests that you have in your garden. So, and they really need compost and, and uh, leaves and things to hide under and to live, live under. So, so it's very important to leave the leaves. And, of course, you have moths, and uh, there's a fritillary butterfly there as well who, you know, potentially will lay, e lay eggs in the dry leaves. Sometimes they form cocoons to overwinter in the leaf matter. So, if we're, again, if we're collecting up that leaves, leaf matter and get, getting rid of it, um, you know, we could be getting rid of a lot of really wonderful little creatures when we're doing that. Oh, one more thing. Sorry, before we go, Brian. What if you don't have enough leaves? And, of course, that can always be an issue because, you know, I can never seem to get enough leaves. Well, there, of course, there's, 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 there's options. Next. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. I've, uh, I've done this, actually. Um, it's an option. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have enough. <laughs> Nancy had fun. Nancy and I had fun doing this, this photograph. Neighbors were a little concerned, but... Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, much better done under the cover of darkness, I would say. <laughs> but, uh, but thankfully, uh, we don't have to do that today. We don't have to do that tonight because the city of Coquitlam has come through for us and they have offered up free compost for everyone here, which is fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. Round of applause for the city of Coquitlam. Right. Uh, do not disturb. 70% um, of our wild bees, our native bees, are ground-dwelling bees. And, and here's a mining bee that uh, you may be familiar with. So in the springtime, if we see these little, little uh, mounds there with a hole in it where they've dispersed some of the soil, um, that's great news. You've, you might have some mining bees going on there. Uh, they'll come out in the, uh, in the springtime, they hibernate in the soil, and they'll pop out in the springtime. And really, they're only really active for about five or six weeks. So if we can leave them be and just appreciate them and not disturb the areas of the soil. Uh, when I was working for the city of Poco, there was a huge colony actually um, uh, in Lions Park, right beside the playground, just north of the playground. There's a lot of compacted soil there in the turf. 
and uh, all these little solitary bees were digging their tunnels down into the, uh, into the uh, soil there. So they often appear in your, in your really beaten up lawn areas, but uh, sometimes they're compacted soil areas. These ones, this is a sandy one here, but um, um, very, important, very important pollinators. So just be aware that we're not disturbing our soil too much. Native versus non-native, um, this is a big one. Uh, a lot of people feel very strongly uh, that native plants are the only way to go. And of course, um, a lot of us, you know, uh, plant all kinds of uh, introduced species as well. So I'm somewhere in the middle here. Um, there's definitely really, really great reasons and we, we want to plant as many native plants as we can. And the big reason for that is because we really have two different types of bees that we have. We have generalists, like this little green uh, sweat bee there, which I was delighted to see in my garden. And, that's, uh, and that one's taking advantage of a peony which is, of course, a non-native uh, uh, flower. And this other little one here is on a Saskatoon berry. Um, but some bees uh, that are, are uh, what they call floral specialists. And so they will only feed on a certain genera of plants or even a specific species of plant. And that's all they'll feed on. So for those bees, we really have to make sure that we're planting a wide diversity of native plants as much as we can uh, to help those along. Um, but of course, there's these generalists, like bumblebees, they'll also go to many different types of plants. And so I think it really is just about floral diversity, planting as many different things as we can that are pollinating, that are um, sort of pollen, pollen producing and nectar producing as well. Uh, another good reason to go with natives, plant natives, of course, this is our wonderful western tiger swallowtail butterfly, one of the most beautiful butterflies we have here. And they actually want to, uh, they'll lay their eggs in cottonwoods, uh, our native cherry, and it's Prunus emarginatus, our native cherry tree that grows here, willows as well. So if we provide those sort of native trees, um, we're going to get a lot more of these beautiful butterflies as well. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, and this is why I argue a little bit for some of the non-natives. This uh, is a picture of uh, a, a bumblebee there, obviously on a crocus. And with this warm weather coming up in the next couple of days, we're probably going to see the queen bumblebees coming out. They're going to start coming out of hibernation right about now. And with our wild temperature fluctuations that we have, um, it, it's, what it's, what's happening in the, in the wild um, uh, in the, with the flowers is that sometimes they're getting out of sync, out of synchronicity. So what happens if it warms up really quickly and a bee comes out of hibernation and there isn't enough flowers there for the bee? They need to feed on nectar uh, right away as soon as they come out of hibernation. And if those flowers aren't there, and at times maybe the native flowers aren't actually in bloom yet, you know, then they can run into some real, real problems and perhaps starve. So if you plant a handful of crocuses in your garden, a bunch of crocuses, grape hyacinths, anything that's really early blooming, um, these bees are going to benefit from that. And then, uh, and then a little bit later in the season, of course, all our native plants will be blooming and they'll have lots of, uh, 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 lots of sources for, for food. On the other side here, this is Mahonia uh, media ex charity. And we have our own Mahonia, of course, our native Mahonias. But this one actually blooms in the middle of winter. So it can bloom in December and January. This picture was taken in, on November 5th. Um, not a time when you'd expect to see a honeybee out, out pollinating, but then again, our crazy weather patterns that we've been getting due to climate change has kind of thrown a wrench into everything. So, so I think there, are, there is room for, uh, for uh, some uh, non-native species as well. So getting into the gardens now, this is the fun part here. Um, this is a garden that, uh, that I, I, I built just a, a few years ago at the a place that I work at, at Redwoods Golf Course. And as you can see, this was just a, uh, a typical parking lot bed with just turf grass in it, um, boring old turf grass. But it was right at the entranceway to our establishment, right up down the driveway. And it's about the first thing you see as you turn the corner is this, this bed here. And so I said to the owner, I said, you know, I said, we really need to do something a little more interesting there. It's something more colorful. I think we need a garden there. Gardeners are always pushing for more garden space. There's, there's, that's, that's what we do. But unfortunately, golf course owners are always pushing for more turf. And he said, James, I don't know. He said, I kind of like the turf. He goes, it's a golf course. We, we do turf, right? We, we like, we, this is what we do, right? And uh, yeah, we like grass. And I said, well, I can show you grass. I can show you some grasses. And so I convinced him, managed to convince him to plant this garden here. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side there, that's the first year that we planted these grasses. And, uh, and this is just three years later. That's how full this is. 
So if we want almost, I know I always like to say there's no such thing as instant garden, but if you want a, uh, a garden that's going to fill in really quickly and not take much time, in just three years, you can have something that, 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 you know, that looks similar to this. Grasses, of course, have been around for, I mean, they've been trendy for probably 20, almost 30 years, I would say now. But for good reason. Um, there's a great, uh, great bunch of reasons to plant grasses. The drought tolerance is, is much better than turf grass. They have very, very deep root systems, so it allows them to access water. Um, like I say, drought tolerant. Uh, they are very uh, carefree as well. Once you plant these grasses, uh, you really don't have to do too much to them. You've got to water them initially to establish them for sure, that first season. You're going to have to keep watering them a bit. But after that, they're, they're, they're pretty carefree. Uh, you know, you do have to dig them up every five years or so and divide them or take a piece off of them eventually. But, uh, but they're great for that. Um, and also, unlike our turf grass, they don't really require fertilizers. So as long as you have a decent soil to start with, uh, you don't have to fertilize these. If you fertilize ornamental grasses, they actually can get too much nitrogen, too leggy, and just kind of fall over. So it's a real tough, tough prairie type grasses, uh, very resilient, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we need with our climate changing uh, the way it is, um, for sure. Uh, and of course, they, um, they also provide uh, a lot of habitat as well. They're great spaces to hide in here for birds. And uh, every time I'd go and tend to this garden, there was always little birds, always, you know, hiding and sheltering under these grasses here. But when we combine them with pollinator-friendly plants, then we get something really special. And I like to call this the prairie pollinator garden. Um, it's just a name I came up with. But when you combine this with these wonderful uh, perennials, all these perennials that we're going to see are all nectar-producing or pollen-producing. And now you've got a really great nature scape. You've got stuff for the bees, you've got these seed heads here, which are going to provide uh, wonderful forage for birds uh, all through the season. And, uh, and so I think, it's, um, I think this kind of style of gardening is, 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 is really great. It's really good for people who have a sunny um, exposure, if you have self-exposure, and if you have very sandy soil, good drainage. Um, this is a garden that just might work for you. Of course, when we plant our pollinator-friendly uh, uh, perennials, we want to make sure that we're planting right from early season. We want something early season for them to, to dine on and all the way through mid, midsummer and into late summer. So a wide range of different plants is what we're really looking for, right from the spring to the fall. Um, the other thing about this too is you can see how full these uh, grasses and perennials have become. And that really cuts down on your maintenance weed-wise as well. They've really crowded out. They've covered up all the soil. There's really not much place for weeds to actually take root and start growing. The ones that do grow or tend to be really long and spindly and very easy to pull out. So from a maintenance perspective, uh, prairie pollinator gardens um, work pretty well too. Um, this is, I'm very fond of this picture. This is the old Port Coquitlam Library before it got uh, demolished. And uh, this is a little pollinator garden that we uh, planted there. Um, yeah, and unfortunately it's, it's no longer here. It's progress, I guess, as they call it. But uh, anyway, um, planting in groups is really important as well. Um, we want to plant in a large group of maybe a meter around uh, of one type of plant. And this is really valuable to the pollinators. To, they have to work less. There's more sources of, uh, of nectar and pollen closer together. Because many of our tiny little native bees will only fly a very short distance. They don't, they don't uh, forage like honeybees or bumblebees will. So the more that you can plant, the denser you can plant your uh, flowers there, the more they're going to benefit as well. Nothing succeeds like success. Um, yeah, I like that line. Um, all different floral types are really important. Uh, the compositae type uh, flowers, the echinaceas and the uh, rebecca there, daisy type flowers. Uh, two beautiful flowers, of course, for hummingbirds are really important. In the back, I think there's uh, perennial flocks there as well. So the more diversity we can put in there, the, the better it is. Uh, I once talked to a bee expert who was talking about the trouble that they have with blueberry crops and they have honeybees pollinating blueberry crops and how they're actually becoming malnourished because they're only able to, to, to feed on one type of nectar. And she said, it's kind of like us having only broccoli to eat. It's good for you, but you need a lot more. You know, you need, you need some other things. So uh, that kind of made sense to me. Um, and there in the middle, of course, you see that someone's done the right thing there. They provided a bit of water. They provided a bird bath for the... Uh, for all the creatures. And there's just a really neat little, it's nice when, when, when animals share, isn't it? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I love that picture. It's great. So yeah, so providing water uh, in the garden is really important. Uh, bird baths are great. And especially for bees, um, you could also put a dish with pebbles in it. Pebbles, rocks, stones, fill that up with water. It makes it much easier for the bees to actually land on those rocks and actually find the water so they don't actually fall into the water and drown. You know, so, so that's a, an option as well for our bees. And of course, um, these gardens work really well for the wintertime, and some people would argue that the best season of all for ornamental grasses is wintertime. Um, these gorgeous seed heads, they, they just go right, right through the winter. Uh, and again, we don't want to chop them back. We just want to leave them the whole season long, because if you get a bit of frost on them after a cold winter night, they just are absolutely spectacular. And again, we want to leave them on as long as we can to feed those birds through the wintertime as well. So we can scale this down. Uh, the beds that I usually build, of course, are larger beds, or uh, sometimes park beds or beds for golf courses. But I really like this uh, picture here. Um, I wished I had done this landscape. I, it's not mine, but I wish I had, because I, I think it looks really great. Uh, and I love the balance here. You've got these tall grasses there, the Calamagrastis, Carl Forster, very vertical. But it balances really well with this tree on the other side. So as you can see, if you want to do this at home in a small front yard garden, it's really not that hard. You know, you keep with your groupings, uh, have a bit of variation there. There's some evergreen um, conifers in here, which is great. And that's the one thing that really helps with planting grasses is evergreens because there is a point in time when you've got to cut back your grasses in the, in the uh, late winter, early spring. And it does look a little bare, so it's, it's great to have uh, some conifers to go with those grasses as well. Um, the only thing I might do a little differently here is maybe add a little more um, um, flowering um, perennials um, for the pollinators, of course. And the tree here, I'm not quite sure what tree this is. It looks like it could be an aspen, perhaps. It also, also looks a little bit like a ginkgo tree. Um, I'm not quite sure, but my advice on this is that if, we're, if we only have space for one tree, well, let me back that up. If we have space for one large tree, plant it for sure. We need as many shade trees in our communities as we, as we can get. And really important, so if you have room for a great big tree, big shade, big canopy tree, it's, it's a good idea to plant those. But if you only have room for one small tree, let's make it count. Let's make, it, let's make sure that it's either providing pollen, nectar, or berries. Next one. And this is one of my favorites. The, uh, it's the uh, Japanese snowbell, Styrex japonicus. Um, it is absolutely covered in bees in the summertime. So a really valuable pollinator. It's a nice small tree, medium sized, a small to medium sized tree, and it, it would work well in a front yard uh, environment. Here's another one that I like quite a bit. Um, again, it's, it's not hard to do, very simple, just using groupings of grasses. Uh, it looks like there's a, 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 a woolly thyme or a ground cover of thyme there, which is a good pollinator friendly uh, plant. Um, a few shrubs mixed in, and this is all you need. It doesn't have to be complicated, it can be very easy, but you've got a nice nature friendly garden right there. So now into some of, the, some of my favorite perennials. Um, this one actually is, um, as it sounds, Verbena peruguensis. It actually does come from South America, so a bit of an exception to the rule here. But it is a fabulous, very wispy, tall-growing perennial. Um, now, it's just borderline hardy, so in a, in a real, uh, real cold snap or a real rough winter, you might not get them coming back, but they're, they're, they're very, very cheap, easy to buy. They do self-seed, so that's, that's a, a nice thing, but they're not invasive. So they're not going to get carried away on you. But uh, the, uh, the bumblebees absolutely love this perennial. Gallardia here is one of our natives. Uh, this is great for the front of the border. Um, the Gallardias um, uh, bloom for a, a good time through the mid, uh, mid-summer. And again, they are just covered with bees. Um, it's a real favorite. So again, planting those native pollinators is really important. Yeah, blanket flower is a common name, yeah. Now this is one of my, and it might just be my all-time favorite perennial, um, the uh, Cinera cardunculus, or ornamental artichoke. And, and actually these leaves are edible, by the way. You can actually uh, uh, steam them and eat them um, a little bit like you would uh, a, a, leaf, a leafy green type of uh, vegetable. But why would you? I mean, just look at these beautiful leaves. I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean I, I, couldn't, I couldn't damage a, a, a plant that looks like that. But it's, from an architectural perspective, it's absolutely gorgeous, and it goes with all kinds of other perennials really well, like pinks, whites, blues. It goes really well with this beautiful silvery leaf. But there's more to it than just the leaf. It gets even better. 
gorgeous, gorgeous flower. Um, it'll send up a stalk about four feet high or three to four feet high, I guess. And then it has, um, uh, it's, it's a little bit like a, um, looks a little bit like, a, oh, I'm not thinking of here. What's the, um, sorry, can't get, thistle, thistle. Yeah, it looks a lot like a thistle flower. So, you know, and thistles, of course, we, you know, they, we, they're, they're invasive weeds. We don't want to really um, have those. But this is not invasive at all. It's a great big, beautiful flower. And again, just covered in bees. They absolutely love it. And then it gets even better than that. Because <laughs> this is the seed head. So again, um, if you have a perennial that provides um, um, food for the bees, and then it also provides food for the birds, and this is a beautiful little female American goldfinch uh, taking advantage of these seeds. And you can kind of see on the, with the larger photo there, the, these large, rich, oil, oil-rich oil seeds that it produces. So it's a real favorite of, uh, of birds. And with any luck, if you're really lucky, you might just get an American goldfinch come to your garden if you, if you plant this one. Uh, Rebecca Herbstone. Um, this is a real big giant, and, but I love it because it's uh, great for the back of the border if you want to make a statement. Uh, this perennial really works well. It can get up to about seven feet in height. Um, and so sometimes it needs staking, but uh, often if you plant it tight with other plants or shrubs, trees, it can lean on those and it, and it, and it doesn't need staking. So um, again, late season of summer all the way. This will bloom all the way through October. Um, fantastic perennial. And again, bees absolutely love it. Perovskia, Russian sage. Uh, this is a great one. It's very, very drought tolerant, great for dry beds, sandy areas. And uh, this one again, bees love this one too. Um, and it's very aromatic. It's, uh, it's got that sagey smell to the leaf as well. So that's a, it's, it's really nice as well in the summertime. You can just pick up that smell from it too. Echinaceas, coneflowers, um, really, this is sort of like the prairie plant, I guess, really. Um, this is one of my favorites personally, uh, Magnus. And it's very, very much, it's very, very similar, very true to the species. It's not, uh, echinaceas, you can get all kinds of wild colors now and all kinds of different frilly, frilly uh, petals and things like that. But, but uh, Magnus is one of my favorites for sure. And this is one of those ones, again, you don't want to deadhead these because this, the birds love the seeds on these ones as well. And they'll, I watch them in my garden eating seeds right, right up through, uh, for, through February. So, so valuable for, for the birds. And this is one that we don't see planted all that much, but I really like it. Uh, Persicaria and Plexicollis firetail, um, mountain fleece firetail. Um, very long blooming. That's what I really like about this one. It can take quite a bit of, uh, it can handle rough soil. It can, I've seen it growing in clay or, or in uh, leaner, sandier soils as well. So a very tough, resilient plant um, and uh, blooms for a very long period of time through the summer. Of course, we can't forget our hummingbirds. And this is one of the best if you want to attract hummingbirds, Crocosmia lucifer. Uh, Crocosmias, of course, are like a little bulb, like a corum, uh, just like a, um, like a crocus. And, uh, but they grow, I guess, to about three feet tall. And, um, and just the hummingbirds um, are just all over those when they're in bloom. So good one to attract the birds. Um, this one I like a lot because it's earlier blooming. Uh, it's, that's a short one. This is Salvia May Night. Salvias, of course, uh, are great nectar producers. And uh, this one is great because it blooms before the other ones come into bloom. So you're providing that early season um, food for the, for the bees. And I think just in behind it there, that looks like some Perovskia growing up in behind it. So the Salvia fades out and the Perovskia starts to bloom. You've got a continuation in the garden. Uh, another favorite of mine, Coreopsis verticillata moonbeam. Um, a lot of these ones I pick because they're just such a long blooming time uh, with them. Again, really great for front of the border. Very small growing, only, only um, just about a foot or so tall, couple, maybe a couple of feet tall. So it's a good one for the front of the border. And uh, Napita, um, Walker's Low. Um, it's in the mint family. It's a, it's a type of catnip. And uh, so, and the, but the cats won't be all in there. It's not that kind of catnip. So, so you don't have to worry about that. Amy, you're not going to be able to use this one. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, it, again, it, it's absolutely, it's one of the best that I know for front of the border. Uh, the bees will be swarming all over that all summer long. This one, this one actually does well when it, when you do, she if it does uh, finish blooming, shear it back a little bit. You might get that second flush of blooms as well. So on this one, you do want to shear it back. Uh, this is kind of cool. Um, Solidago rugosa fireworks. Um, again, it's just um, a really good, tough plant. We know we, know we have a native Solidago canadensis. 
uh, which you can plant as well. That would certainly work. But some of our native ones, like the Achillea and uh, our, our native um, uh, Solidago, they do run. They have those rhizomes that really spread quickly through the garden. So you've got to be a little careful with that and be able to control them. This one doesn't. It's very sort of clump forming. And uh, it's also native to North America, but it's just more central and eastern native. But fireworks is a wonderful cultivar and it pairs really beautifully with these asters. Any kind of asters you can put in the garden are going to be beneficial too. And uh, yeah, one of my favorites. And of course our own lupin. Um, um, yeah, the Nootka lupin. And we have several types of lupins in British Columbia. And uh, this one I think would work well in almost a, a, a woodland setting or a prairie type setting. Um, very tough, tough plants. Beauty about lupins as well, of course, is they are nitrogen fixing. Like a lot of the legumes that we grow, they are able to fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen in, into their root systems. Little nodules on their roots, actually, you know, from the bacteria that colonize the, the roots, are able to take in uh, nitrogen. So you can have a very poor soil, and growing lupins on that for a few years is going to really enrich your soil with nitrogen. Of course, another one, the bee balm, most of you probably are familiar with this one. Another one that the uh, hummingbirds just cannot resist. So I uh, always like to plant a little bit of Monarda. It grows very easy, uh, very shallow rooted, and you're easy to divide and move around. And of course, that's the other thing about perennials is that unlike annuals, once you have them, you know, you've got the perennials and you can divide them, give them to your friends, um, you know, have a little garden sale outside your yard, whatever. Um, but uh, but it's a, that's another great reason to grow perennials. Uh, I think Nancy kind of covered this one pretty well already, but I'll just quickly go through this. Um, not all flowers are created equal. If, uh, if you're unable to, uh, to see the sort of working parts of the flowers, of the reproductive parts of the flower, and you can't see those golden stamens with the pollen on them, then they're really not much use to, to, to pollinators either. So when we hybridize things, we gain some features, you know, these frilly uh, extra petals. Um, and that rose is actually, it's a beautiful smelling rose. It might be a David Austin rose, I'm not sure, but it looks like it could be. Um, we've seen a lot of this in our communities lately. Um, sadly, our, our beautiful um, western red cedars and the cultivars of our red cedars here are just not holding up with the, drought, uh, with the droughts we've been having. Um, it used to be our go-to hedge, and uh, yeah, it was just a thing that everyone did. You, you plant a cedar hedge. Uh, but now we're going to have to look at some other alternatives. And uh, I wanted to cover hedging because it's something we don't often think about as habitat. But hedges can be excellent habitat for birds, other creatures. So uh, again, what we're going to try and do here is think outside the box a little bit and, and maybe some, some different types of things that we might be able to try instead of the poor old cedar hedge. This is also dead, he dead hedging. Um, it's today's dead hedging. And uh, it, it, at first blush, I looked at this and I kind of thought, wow, it's, you know, just kind of, you know, it looks kind of dead. But, <laughs> which it is. But just think of all the really wonderful creatures that could live in here. I mean, this is great habitat. All these little cracks and crevices in the branches. Uh, you get all kinds of uh, insects nesting in there. Uh, native bees might nest in there. So it's actually really great habitat. And I thought to myself, well, you don't have to just leave it like that. What if we had that, but we also planted a honeysuckle vine over top of it, perhaps? Or maybe a rambling rose over top of it. Now you've got a bit of a, a green fence there, but it's got, it's got pollinator-friendly flowers, but it's also got this wonderful habitat there for, uh, for nesting as well. And this is a little bird that's very urbanized now, the white-crowned uh, sparrow. Yeah, so these little guys um, will nest in hedges, and I've seen this before. I've even seen one of these nesting in a little round, trimmed uh, Berberus hedge uh, right, near, right near a walking path. So they're, maybe in a sense they get protection from that, from being close to, uh, to where people are a active. I mean, you're probably not going to get hawks and things around those areas. So, so they found a bit of a niche, and, and don't be surprised if you find one of these in your hedge. Uh, making a nest. This is an oldie but a goodie. I think it's um, um, it's kind of gets forgotten about a little bit. The pyracantha hedge uh, li literally translates to fire thorn uh, in Latin. But uh, but you said, as you can see in the springtime, it's just covered in these beautiful white flowers, uh, irresistible to pollinators. So and of course you get the benefit of having some berries on there as well through the summertime. So um, yeah, it can be a bit of a nasty hedge. You don't maybe use it everywhere if you've got young children and that. That that might be a bit of an issue. But I think it's uh, it's a hedge that we could uh, we, we should see more of. You know, um, think about our hedges as as being um, contributing to um, naturescaping. 
this is a native hedge here, which I think uh, um, probably most of you have seen used once or, once or twice out there. Uh, Mahonia apifolium. Um, I think what's kind of sad though is you often see this hedge used in like store parking lots. You know, you'll go to a, a Safeway or a Walmart or something and someone's decided to just put it right in the island bed there in the middle of the heat where it just bakes in the sun all day long. And I think these, these ones do best if it's in a park shade environment, actually. I don't think they should be planted right in the full sun. Uh, they can take sun, for sure, but I think to make it look you know, healthy and, and vigorous like this, um, you want to make sure you're putting that in a little bit of a more protected, more shaded area. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what this was. I was looking at it, and it looks like a bit of a meadow that's grown onto a wall. Um, but I think this is one of those little uh, country roads, probably in Great Britain somewhere, yeah. I would think, yeah. And perhaps what this is, uh, what it is, what's going on here, is this could be an old rock wall or, or a brick wall of some kind that's just over time has gotten soil uh, uh, into the rocks there and has started to grow natural or native grasses and perennials here. Uh, but I think it looks great. Um, I think it's a really interesting, interesting hedge and uh, I'd love to see, you know, I'd like to see creative things like this. And this is probably just nature doing its thing. But, uh, but it looks pretty cool. I like this one. Um, this is another really cool idea that I like a lot here, um, the mixed wildlife hedge. And uh, this is becoming a bit of more of a trend here. And basically, again, what's old is new again. And when you look at the old British hedgerows, um, where they would you know, use these um, um, native hedging thickets and uh, all kinds of... Uh, uh, all kinds of uh, small shrubs and trees to create a natural barrier and that would stop livestock from crossing over into other fields. But they also became really great habitat uh, places for, for birds and, and pollinators as well. And so um, this is one I just kind of threw together. This would be ones that I would choose and I would select um, because they're all about the same size shrubs here. And uh, I think it's a nice combination. This could take uh, sun to part shade, all these plants in here. Uh, oh, sorry, back one there again. And a, a bit of a funny story here, actually, because we were, uh, Nancy and I were going through these, and Nancy, thank you very much, you helped me a lot on my uh, PowerPoint presentation here, with, um, um, putting it all together. But uh, anyway, I was looking at, and, and telling her which, which of these shrubs that I, I think we should include. And, uh, and I said, you know, I really, I really like that. I really like the viburnum, uh, I, um, as I said, I really like the viburnum mm -hmm. triloba. I said, I think that's a, that's a good one we should, we should include. And she said, bum. I, and I said, I, I said pardon? <laughs> and, and she said, um, I think it's bum. And, 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 and of course, she ends up being right. It's not actually viburnum triloba. It is, in fact, viburnum tri trilobum. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> come on, it's not that bad, was it? Was it that bad? <laughs> But, uh, but it's a great shrub because uh, obviously you get these wonderful tra translucent red berries. Um, the flowers, of course, pollinator friendly, but it also it gets a great fall color too. So it gets a real burgundy red fall color uh, to the shrub there. Um, the aronia, um, melanocarpa, again, that's the black choke cherry. Um, that's a, a native of, uh, of uh, North America, but maybe not so much on the West Coast here. But that one, again, also gets a real rich orange color in the fall, too. So you're getting berries, you're getting the, the gorgeous fall color, so it's a really beautiful looking shrub. Uh, and of course, Ribe sanguinium, uh, like the one we've got down here, uh, that one is fantastic because uh, uh, it's just, as, you, as most of you know, uh, hummingbirds actually go crazy over that. And you can time this one as it flowers. When it flowers, uh, you basically can time the rufous hummingbirds coming back uh, from their migration. So. It's really nice to see uh, this one come into bloom. And it should be blooming out there almost, almost right now, very shortly. Um, Mahoney, we talked about already. The Nutka Rose, we've got a couple of native roses. And uh, these are awesome, awesome to plant. Um, and I think it would go well in a hedge type setting as well. So, yeah. So now we move on to um, the woodland gardens. And uh, we wanted to do, well, we, we hesitated about this a little bit because really, Woodland gardens are, are such a, a, a complex ecosystem, really, that we could do an entire night on woodland gardens, probably two nights on woodland gardens. There's so many different kinds, so many different variations, uh, whether it be eastern woodland, Pacific Northwest, uh, Carolinian woodland, uh, there's tropical woodlands. I mean, they're, they're all over the world, temperate world. Um, but we thought we'd, we, we, we should talk about this because when you think about it, woodland gardens are probably one of the best habitat gardens you could have. 
you know, you have basically four layers to it. Uh, you've got the canopy layer, the high canopy layer, you've got the understory trees, uh, you've got the shrub layer, and then of course you've got your ground cover layer as well. So all these different habitats provide different, different sorts of, of, of refuge and shelter for, for different types of birds. So that's why it's, it's so really valuable. And it also, of course, protects uh, uh, tender plants as well. So, so woodlands, um, yeah. And we wanted to do something completely opposite from the prairie pollinator garden. So if you've got a shady area uh, as opposed to a sunny, bright exposure, um, this kind of garden um, um, is, is going to work wonderful. The thing to remember about the woodland garden too, though, is it's not like the pollinator garden that grows in and fills in very fast. This is a long-term proposition. You, it's going to take years to develop a woodland, but, uh, but you know, if you have the uh, large trees in your neighborhood already, you may already have a head start. And here's the canopy layer, and typically in the uh, Pacific Northwest, it's conifers. And uh, we have our, our sort of big uh, three or four conifers, I guess, our Douglas firs, our Sitka spruce, uh, red cedars, of course, and uh, hemlocks, too, that we have as well. And like I was saying, if you happen to have um, some beautiful big trees like this in your neighborhood, and some of the older neighborhoods around still do have these large trees, uh, I would consider yourself to be very lucky. For one thing, you're going to probably have a very cool neighborhood, a cool yard, which is terrific. Um, and, uh, and you may, like I say, you may already have that shade that you need to start building a little garden. And of course, within that large canopy uh, of trees, you often get um, some, some wildlife trees or some dead trees. And I know that uh, the parks people, I'm sure the Coquitlam Parks folks are doing a great job at, 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 at protecting these trees. And if they're not in a target zone, if they're not in an area where they're going to fall and injure somebody and, and cause problems and liabilities and, and injuries, um, it's best to leave these trees if we can. Uh, obviously, they provide fantastic habitat. And here we see a pileated woodpecker, and they are a keystone species in our forest. They are probably the most valuable bird that we have in our woodland forest because those holes that they excavate, uh, they make for their nests. Then once they've finished using them, uh, it's great habitat for owls. Uh, other woodpeckers will, will nest in them. Um, I even heard of wood ducks nesting in, uh, in areas that, uh, that maybe they've made holes in. So, um, so very valuable species here. And if you have a tree like this in your backyard, unfortunately, if a tree's died and, or you've got to get rid of it, or it's a dangerous tree, um, think about getting an arborist in to maybe do an inspection, have a look at it, see if it, how safe or how dangerous it really is. Because maybe that can be topped, maybe it can be taken in half and you can retain this, the bottom half of the tree for, uh, for this kind of habitat. Um, and by the way, only top dead trees, okay? No topping live trees. We don't, want to be, we don't want to be doing that. That really does damage trees, but that's a whole other evening. So if a tree does have to come down in your yard, and sadly it happens, you know, sometimes they, they fail, sometimes they're dangerous, you've got to take them down. But how about we retain the wood? Let's not get rid of the wood. That's a very valuable uh, um, uh, nature feature. And this is a type of garden here, the stumpery, that actually goes way back. Nancy was talking about the... Um, the, uh, the lawns and how far back they go to medieval times. Well, stumperies are, are not that old, but they do go back to Victorian times. And the very first stumpery was actually, I believe, in Staffordshire in England uh, in about 1856 is when that one first appeared. And uh, I think it was some wealthy guys, some wealthy dudes who, who really wanted to show off their fern collections. Um, plant collecting was a big thing, of course, back then, and still is now. Uh, and this is a great way of stacking stumps on top of each other and, and creating what I think visually is quite, quite impressive. It's very architectural looking. Uh, and it was also a great way to show off their, their fern collections. But it works really well for us today. And uh, uh, I, I really like this for so many reasons. You know, if you've got, let's say, very poor soil, you've got very heavy clay soil, yeah, a way that you can um, get around this is building up these uh, bits of wood and uh, driftwood or stumps and then putting soil in there, putting humus-rich soil into these little pockets, and then you've got a great place to, uh, to showcase your, your woodland plants. This particular picture, by the way, was actually, it, it, is, it does belong to King Charles. This is High Grove in, uh, in England, so I think if it's good enough for the king, it's got to be good enough for us. <laughs> Of course, you can scale this down a bit. Not all of us have a, a yard as big as high growth to work with. Uh, but here, um, yeah, life after death. The stumps, of course, uh, are wonderful for, for ecosystems. And as they begin to rot, 
you can you can see that uh, uh, you've got some fungus that's uh, inhabiting it, that's basically taking over the logs here and helping to to break those down. And the fungus themselves and mushrooms provide uh, food for for other creatures as well, and some of the small mammals, like mice. And, uh, and other creatures too. So it's a whole ecosystem. And uh, um, you can see this person here has, has taken the hollowed out stumps and put ferns in them, got very creative and stacked them up. So again, you know, it can just be a small corner of your garden. It doesn't have to be a large, expansive area, but it's a really, really nature-friendly way to go. And it's nice to see. And of course, the decomposers. Um, this is just some of the wildlife that we have in rotting stumps and logs. Um, and these are just, just tremendously valuable little creatures, um, all helping to decompose uh, those, those wooden stumps and, of course, feeding your soil. Um, and, of course, there's the, all kinds of other things too, carpenter ants. And, uh, and actually, I had heard that uh, carpenter ants are one of the really special uh, uh, food sources for over, overwintering um, pileated woodpeckers, the ones that we just saw. They really, really go for these carpenter ants. So, so um, yeah, just a whole host of different insects and... Uh, um, slugs, snails, and all kinds of things. Great food source for the birds. And again, this is just another picture of uh, some easy things you can do in your own garden. Um, these aren't particular native gardens here. They're, they're, they're non-native uh, hostas and various other things. But I think you get the idea. It, it works really well with our, with our native plants. Uh, one of the ones in the canopy that doesn't get quite enough attention, I think, is our big leaf maple, our very own big leaf maple. Um, how many of you know out there that uh, maple trees are excellent uh, um, nectar producers? They're very valuable for our, for our, for our um, native bees. Um, early blooming, of course, they're usually right around uh, mid-April. You'll see these kind of inconspicuous uh, chartreuse-colored flowers here, but they will be covered in bees, and they're certainly taking advantage of that. The other cool thing about the big leaf maple is that uh, they have, of course, as you know, these very deep ridges in the bark, and it's really able to hold on to a lot of moisture, it retains a lot of water in this bark, and in no time uh, you get all kinds of mosses and lichens and fungi growing in there, soil begins to form actually after a while from leaf debris and other things in, in these um, ridges in the bark, and the next thing you know you've got this beautiful licorice fern growing here too. So. Uh, the big leaf maple supports more life on, on, on the actual tree than any other tree that we have in, in our Pacific Northwest. So it's a very valuable habitat tree. But of course, if you don't have the space for uh, a large big leaf maple, and uh, many of us don't have that kind of space, this is a tree that I think is really underutilized. Uh, of course, it's our, our very own Acer circinatum, the um, vine maple. Um, it's a, I think it's a great landscape tree. You know, we often just automatically go to the Japanese maples um, for the big fall color show. Um, but again, we have um, our very own, uh, which works very well in the landscape. Um, it can take sun, and it can take actually quite deep shade as well. So it's a really great uh, understory tree that we can use. And of course, we, uh, it too produces flowers, a little different looking than the big leaf maple, but, but again, good source of nectar for our pollinators. And you can see the brilliant colors that we get in the fall with this um, fantastic reddish orange color to the vine leaf maple. Now, the understory trees uh, we're getting into now, and uh, this is kind of where it all sort of happens, I think. The, these are the floral producers, and the understory is usually, usually made up of deciduous trees. Uh, and uh, this one here uh, can, uh, is, is, is one of the best that we can, we can get. One of our, our native Saskatoon berry, and the length here, um, Ulnifolia. And this one, of course, produces the beautiful flowers. Um, and, of course, you get the delicious fruit that you can, uh, the birds, of course, will eat. And, of course, we can make pies and jellies and things out of the, out of the fruit of the service berry as well. Um, and um, in the summertime, if you pay close attention to this tree, you'll see it just covered in tiny little native bees. All getting the getting the uh, nectar source out of the out of this uh, tree. Uh, Cornelian cherry is another one that's not a native. It's a it's a European. Um, but I, I like this one a lot for the same reasons. Uh, early early flower. So uh, so it'd be flowering right about now, and sometimes it flowers a little bit earlier um, in March. And um, um, again, it's followed by these beautiful little ripe. Um, uh, red fruit here, and they call it Cornel Cornelius cherry, but of course it is a dogwood, it's cornus, cornus mass, and uh, irresistible to the birds as well, so, and perfectly edible for humans too, so you don't have to worry about poisonous berries. And of course our Pacific dogwood, um, beautiful, beautiful understory tree, I mean it's 
you know, it's, it's iconic. It's one of our favorites for sure. Um, the only trouble, of course, though, is that, is, as many of you may know, anthracnose, um, uh, a leaf blight that attacks the, uh, the attacks the dogwood tree. And so we've lost a lot of our native dogwoods. They've struggled to get through this. Um, you do see some in the woodlands that look pretty good, but others, others really suffer. And uh, so we have an alternative for that. If you want to plant something that is very, very similar to this tree. Next one, Brian. And that is Eddie's White Wonder. Uh, now, Eddie's White Wonder dogwood is actually a cross between the Pacific uh, dogwood and the Eastern dogwood, Corns, Florida. But the beauty of this tree is it has a resistance to the anthracnose, so it doesn't catch it. And uh, really, um, other than the drooping sort of branching on it, uh, it looks very, very similar to our native dogwood. So it's a nice replacement if you still want that look, but you're looking for a healthier tree. Flower and Red Current, we talked about that one already. Um, it, it is, like I say, you can uh, pretty much set your clock by this one as far as the return of the Rufus hummingbirds. Um, interesting though, there's a lot of different ones on the market and what you'll notice is that you have, um, one of them is I think uh, King Edward VII, I think it's called, which is a much darker red color of current and you would think that for attracting hummingbirds that that dark red color would be better actually, you know, because they really love the red, red colored flowers. But just what I've observed, and remember we talked about hybridizing and how we can change things when we cultivate uh, some of these. And what I've noticed is that if you have these two side by side, if you have just the straight species of Ribe sanguinium, and you have King Edward the Seventh, I think it, I think it is, you're going to see that the hummingbirds are going to go to this one. Um, there's obviously they're showing us that there's more nectar produced by by the native plant here, the straight native plant. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, it's a softer pink color, but um, if you want to attract the hummers, it's, it's the best one to plant. Uh, beaked hazelnut. How many of us know that there, we have a native hazelnut? Yeah, yeah, uh, beaked hazelnut. Um, you don't see this one around uh, here very often. It's a little bit on the rare side. We quite often see hazelnuts, but they're the introduced hazelnut usually, the European hazelnut. But, uh, but you can see why they call it the beaked hazelnut here. Um, these really interesting sort of sheaths that cover the, cover the sea look like a bird's beak. Uh, here we see the male catkins on the, uh, on the, on the plant as well through the winter time. Very, very attractive landscape shrub as well. Um, not really large growing, um, so very manageable. And of course this was a, a hugely valuable source of food for First Nations people. Um, and they would collect these uh, as a food source of course and, and uh, keep them through the winter time. They would trade it as well, uh, very valuable for, for trading. And, um, and actually in some areas of British Columbia you can find these clustered together because of course it made sense to collect these seeds and grow them really like, a, uh, like an orchard really and tend to them that way. So um, the, the city uh, or the town, I guess it's the town or city of Hazelmere is actually named after, after the uh, big hazelnut. Elderberry, uh, Sambucus racemosa, is, uh, is a real standby for us. Uh, it's a big shrub, but uh, of course these beautiful red berries uh, are irresistible to the birds. Um, it's a good one to plant. It's a large shrub though, but, uh, but it's definitely, uh, you can use this as a screen in your landscape. It's, uh, it's a nice upright shrub. Uh, and quite attractive looking too, I think. But here's another alternative if you don't quite have the space for that. This is um, um, Sambucus canadensis nova. Uh, as the name sort of describes, it was a cultivar from Nova Scotia, it's produced in Nova Scotia. And uh, again, it is a native to, to Canada and uh, the US, but, uh, but just not, the, not so much on the West Coast. Um, but I like this one a lot because it is smaller growing and it is actually cultivated for its berries. So if you are a culinary person and you really want to do something kind of different, you know, you could make a Sambucus or a elderberry vinaigrette or a sauce out of this, or some jellies. Um, so they do have a really, really good harvestable berry here. Uh, so great for somebody who wants to, you know, uh, plant an edible landscape. And of course, you, we have to include our, our huckleberry here, our red huckleberry. Um, it's a fantastic plant and it can handle really deep shade. So if you've got one of those problem areas where it's really, really deep, deep shade, uh, they can grow just fine there. And of course, they produce this lovely, tasty little berry as well. Sorbus uh, scopulina. This is, um, um, I believe this is the, the interior mountain ash because I took this picture and it wasn't the caribou. So, so it's probably not the coastal one, which is, uh, which is the Sitka mountain ash. Um, 
Sitchensis, I believe it is, Sorbus Sitchensis, um, but very similar, almost identical type of tree. Um, and a very small growing tree, so again, great for a smaller yard, smaller garden, and um, really attractive tree. Both of its leaves, I think, are really attractive, nice yellow fall color, and of course these beautiful berries as well. And it's a real favorite, I believe, of uh, these cedar waxwings as well. I really like these ones, so you might have some cedar waxwings turn up in your yard. And there it is. Um, but of course, it's, this is a salmon berry, and of course, salmon berries are a very popular native plant. Um, when you plant a salmon berry, you know, you be prepared. It's going to run a little bit. It does have those rhizomes, so uh, it, it can kind of take over. So put it in a corner of your yard where you can kind of keep it at bay maybe a little bit. Um, but it is a nice one to have for attracting the birds for sure. Oh, and also hummingbirds too. Of course, the flowers are, are great for the hummingbirds. Oh, it's an evergreen honeysuckle. Oh, it's evergreen uh, huckleberry. Here it is. Yeah, so here it is, uh, Vaccinium ovatum, and this particular one is, is Thunderbird. It's a cultivar, but uh, very close to the, um, to, to the original. But it makes just a great shrub. I really like this from a landscape perspective. Uh, again, this would make a really great little hedge uh, as well in a, a, for a shade area. Um, they can actually take quite a bit of shade, the evergreen huckleberries. They, um, they can take some shade for probably about part sun, I guess, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to see it planted in full sun. Um, other, huck other huckleberries you can, you can maybe do that with, but, but this one here, um, fantastic berries, of course, delicious. And I believe Thunderbird was an introduction from UBC, I think, um, I believe it was. So anyway, this is one that we, a picture that we took at Van Dusen Gardens when we were there. And um, I was really, really taken by just how beautiful uh, um, evergreen plant this was, great landscape plant. Uh, berries to be wary of. Uh, just because they produce nice, beautiful red berries, it doesn't mean they're always good to plant, um, and they can be and they can be harmful. So the heavenly bamboo. There's a lot of controversy around this one. Um, it does have, have alkaloids in it, which are can be poisonous to birds. Um, a lot of people don't think that's you know the birds eat enough of them to make a difference, but I think you know we may have seen those pictures going out around on the internet of. Um, of um, the cedar waxwings, the dead cedar waxwings that had just gorged themselves on these, on these berries. So we have so many other great plants and other great berry producing uh, shrubs that we can plant. So why plant the heavenly bamboo if we don't need to? Um, I mean, you can pick off the, uh, the, the berries, but I would just assume not see that used um, in, our, in our landscapes. And the other one, of course, here is the Ilex aquifolium, the, the, the English holly, which, which I mean, I, I love hollies at Christmas time. They're, they're beautiful. But of course, um, um, of course they're, they're a bit of an invasive species now. And the birds, of course, like these too, and they'll eat the berries, take them into the forest and, you know, poop them out. And uh, as you can see, anywhere outside of urban areas, our forests are full of, uh, of hollies right now. And uh, it's, it's becoming a real problem. Uh, so. Please don't plant the uh, hollies if you can help it because, um, because they're invasive. Um, but one you can plant, I didn't include this one, but if you're really, really set on, on holly berries, you can plant the uh, eastern native, which is verticillata, uh, Ilex verticillata, or sparkleberry. Now, this is a deciduous tree. It's not evergreen like this holly, but it produces fantastic berries, um, ed uh, edible for birds, poisonous for humans. But, uh, but they don't, they're not invasive, and uh, I've never seen any, sp any spread around there. So that's probably one that you could plant. It'll be okay. Um, and now to the forest floor. Um, and, and we have some really beautiful native plants that we're going to cover here. And this is Trillium ovatum, our western wake robin, our western uh, trillium. Um, and you can see it intermixed here with uh, bleeding heart, that's right, that's right, Dicenter formosa, that's right, our western bleeding heart. Uh, lovely little ground cover, they, the two really pair very well. This was just taken uh, just in nature, so it wasn't planted, but, um, but really beautiful together, and they work really well. Um, great for the shade garden. And something really interesting about trilliums, you know, we talk a, a lot on the, on the first part about how important insects are, and uh, trilliums and other woodland flowers are, are one of these that really uh, rely quite heavily on ants. 35% of the understory woodland flowers in uh, North America are, the, uh, are, are dispersed by, the seeds are dispersed by ants. A bit of a surprise, um, but you can see we, we included this picture here. Now, this isn't actually a trillium seed. I believe it is um, a bloodroot, uh, um, Sanguinaria canadensis, an eastern flower here. 
But they look really similar. The seed looks very similar because they both have this little appendage that's, that's stuck onto the seed there. And that is very, very rich with oils, fats, and proteins, and, uh, which is a great food source, of course, for the ants. So what they'll do is they'll pick up these, uh, these, um, these seeds, they'll take them back uh, into their little dens, into their burrows uh, in there, and they will eventually be able to extract that um, appendage off of the seed. And once they've eaten that, then of course they toss the seed away. But what they do is they toss it into like their compost pile there, and uh, it happens to be just the perfect place for, uh, for trilliums to set seed and to, to actually um, take hold. So it's just a really amazing symbiotic relationship that's going on there. Um, and, uh, and I believe actually um, some of the dissenters, um, that, that happens with them too. So, so um, yeah, so before we beat up on ants, and I know ants are sometimes hard uh, insects to like, they're also very valuable in our, in our ecosystems. And this is a great one, again, from, uh, from a landscaper's perspective and a gardener's perspective. This is a great ground cover. Uh, it's evergreen. Um, it's sometimes called the dull Oregon grape, the Mahonia nervosa, which I think there's nothing dull about it. I think it's a really beautiful, beautiful shrub. Uh, low ground cover, evergreen. Um, when it gets in the sun, it tends to take on a bit of this red, reddish tinge in the leaf, so it's very attractive that way. Uh, and again, this is another one that can handle really deep shade. So uh, if you've ever been walking in a, a woodland forest where there's large, big canopy trees, um, this one is thriving in, in shade or part sun. So, uh, and again, um, beautiful um, edible berries there, very popular with the birds. And of course, Galtherish Shalon, um, the uh, uh, Salal. Um, this is just the hallmark of our, of our woodland gardens. And uh, you know, wherever we can plant this, I think we should. Um, it's just such a, a, and it's doing really well now. For a while, it seemed to have a, a bit of a nasty leaf blight, and some of the plants didn't look that great, but they're looking really healthy now, so I'm not quite sure what happened there, but um, great to see these, these and uh, I would suggest that if you have a bit of a shady area, the park shade that we try and plant, plant these if we can. And here are the dicentras. Um, I like both of these. Both of these are really pollinator friendly. Uh, the bees really like these. This is the native dicentra formosa that we were talking about earlier. And then, of course, uh, dicentra spectabilis, uh, which is the introduction, but uh, both of them are very, are very um, excellent woodland plants. Uh, Myanthemum um, diliatum, uh, or dilatatum, dilatatum. Uh, this is the uh, wild lily of the valley, or sometimes called the false lily of the valley. Uh, again, beautiful ground cover. It's, it's herbaceous, it does die back in the winter time, but uh, a beautiful, beautiful mat or ground cover um, plant. So um, again, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a keeper. Um, little white flowers there, little, little flower spikes, of course, turn into berries uh, later, sort of almost a marble kind of colored berry that's on this. The berries are edible and they're not, they're not worth eating, they're not choice, but they're not poisonous, so that's good to know because the real lily of the valley, of course, Convalaria majalis, is very poisonous. So don't want to get those mixed up. Um, plant the false lily of the valley. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's much better in that sense. Uh, Aruncus. Um, this is um, this is a beautiful um, uh, shade-loving plant. It's quite tall. It gets gets a good good height to it. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of a stilby in a way, almost. It kind of has that look to it. Um, but it's 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 a real beauty, and it's a tough plant, and it does really well in uh, sort of part sun, part shade, um, and it's definitely worth planting. Uh, our native ginger, um, Acerum caudatum. Um, again, it's, uh, this is a wonderful tactile plant. You know, you can rub the leaves and smell the ginger on it. It's a great little ground cover. It takes, uh, takes quite a bit of shade. Um, it's a nice little delicate uh, flower to plant. Uh, bunch berries, Cornus canadensis. Um, another, another beauty. Um, boy, I tell you, um, it's one of my favorites. Love this one. Berries, of course, are, are, are very valuable to the birds as well. And uh, I think they've changed the name on this too now. I think it's actually called something else, but... I'm kind of old school, I'm still going to call it Cornus canadensis. I, I think it's no longer officially a dogwood, so, so probably not a cornice anymore. But, um, but uh, yeah, great, great ground cover. And of course, a little bit of color, Lil Lilium columbianum. Uh, nice to have a little bit of color in the garden. And uh, this is just one of our nicest little tiger lilies. Beautiful plant, pollinator friendly. Look at those stamens there with all the pollen on them. So, um, nice, little, nice little lily. Ferns, um, we've got lots of different native ferns, and uh, when you think back to that stumpery 
Um, our native ferns would just go so well in that kind of uh, in, in that sort of environment. Uh, if you have a really wet area, um, shady, uh, really damp area, the maidenhair fern is an absolute beauty. It can take a lot of moisture. Uh, and on the flip side of that, the sword fern is actually really drought tolerant too. So you can plant that in the shade. And if you have really dry shade, which is one of the trickiest sort of gardens to, situations to deal with is dry shade, and, and the sword fern works really well there. Um, and then, of course, the deer fern, um, um, very beautiful, very delicate looking. And then the lady fern, too. And the lady fern, of course, has the fiddleheads that are, that are edible, and so some people like to harvest the fiddleheads. But, um, but a word of caution, if you, if you are out foraging, it's becoming a big thing. Uh, a lot of people like to go out and forage and see what they can eat. That's, that's pretty cool to be able to do that, but um, I think we have to be careful that we're not over-harvesting things and over-harvesting berries, that we're not we're being ethical about this and we're, we're, we're leaving a lot of berries behind and we're only taking a small amount from each area. That's really important. Same would be true with, uh, with the fiddleheads of the lady fern here. And um, just looking at the woodland one more time before we leave this, and... I'm sorry we didn't have time to get really in-depth in, into, the, into the woodland gardens, but uh, it can really be anything you want it to be. Um, you know, you, you, it, there's no set rules here. There's so many different kinds of woodlands. Um, this is just a really pretty collection of different plants here that they've done. Um, really like that. So, so um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a great garden to plant if you've got the right shade and uh, those northern exposures. Um, try woodland garden for sure. Okay. Of course, we don't just garden for ourselves or for nature, for, for wildlife. You know, we garden for our families, we garden for our friends. And this is my, uh, my old puppy dog here, this is Keiko. She's 16 years old and uh, on those hot summer days, she likes to just kind of find a little shady nook in the, uh, in the garden there. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, she and she helps me garden quite a bit too. Actually, as well. she likes to she likes to show me where to plant plants. So I can dig holes. And this is my this is my good old dad. He's just uh, he's just kind of recently pretty well passed on a few years back now. But uh, but we lived together in uh, this is my old garden in Coquitlam when I used to live there. And uh, as you can see, we, we took out all the grass in our garden. And uh, of course, being a gardener, I couldn't wait to plant this all up and put in a little waterfall and pond and all that kind of stuff. And I remember feeling a little bad sometimes because, you know, I'd ask, you know, Dad at that point was no longer driving. Um, you know, he, he, he really couldn't get out all that much. I was working full time and very busy. And uh, I always felt kind of bad because I thought, you know, I don't get him out enough maybe. Or maybe, maybe some more trips to out to restaurants and things would be good if I had the time to do that. And I asked him about that one time, and he said, James, he said, that's okay, none of that matters. He said, I've got this garden here to enjoy. And uh, every day he'd be out there watching the birds, looking at the fish in the pond, and just really enjoying it. So, so gardens for our mental health is, is, is just such an important thing, and uh, we can't, we can't um, overstate that, I think. Um, we know that the moment we're in a woodland, the moment we're in a garden, that you know, our stress levels are reduced, our cortisone levels are reduced, our blood pressure, you know, goes down. And uh, it's such a wonderful effect um, on, our, on our well-being, both mentally and physically. You know, we breathe in, um, you know, the uh, volatile compounds from trees, you know, we're actually getting an immune system boost, you know. Um, phytoncides, I don't know if you've heard of those before, but when we breathe those in, they actually do incredible things to our body. They increase the white blood cell count. They uh, increase the blood cells that actually fight off infections and viruses and cancers. So, so immersing ourselves in nature um, is really, really important. Um, forest bathing, of course, has become really important and it's become a really big thing. Um, and, you know, so I look at that and I kind of think, you know, we just, as we all know, we just came through a pandemic a few years ago. And it was a very stressful time for all of us. And we often seeked out our refuge in nature and in forests in times of trouble, in times when we, when we uh, were really stressed and the world seemed to be turning upside down on us. We, we turned to Mother Nature for solace. And she was there for us, which was fantastic. And I think now, at this point... Uh, with the way the climate's going, we really need to be there for her too. And so, um, yeah, so anyway, um, one more here. So here we are. <laughs> and so here's your job, and that is to channel your inner green being and get out there and start planting some nature friendly gardens and do whatever we can to support pollinators, insects, our birds, all the life that we, that we live with in our gardens. 
And uh, let's, let's see if we can make a difference. Thank you.
this kind of um, observation here is uh, here where we go, but on the ground here, you're probably fine. Yeah? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, sort ferns, uh, I, I, I don't think there's, yeah, I, I think I would probably take those off. I mean, I'd leave them, leave, leave them for, for a little longer, um, but then I think, I think when they're fresh growth and starting to come off, you can, you can probably trim those off. Yeah. Last year, I one of those many, many cars lined up at the Forest Lake area to get my tea bag of compost. And I was quite distressed with the fact that here was Earth Day. Me and our cars were lined up for the whole hospital. And I was screaming out for you, you know, I'm a part of the best collector, and I'm not. And um, I wonder if the city has changed how it's going to distribute that to the compost this year. Yes, they are. The man outside keeps giving away the 100 free bags of compost. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so thanks for some feedback that we got last year about people having to wait in line and not in their cars. We've taken a completely different approach this year. So we're looking for those educational moments like tonight where we've got, uh, oh, sorry, yep. So we're looking for opportunities like tonight where we've got a captive audience and people are learning and we can tie in some educational messaging. So we're giving out free big compost tonight. We're not going to have a big compost giveaway event this year. We're also working with our Park Spark team. We've got uh, Timothy from Park Spark over there. So some of the uh, programs and volunteer events this year will be handling out compost there as well. So put in a little bit of sweat equity, get a compost bag, take the time to learn something new, and you'll get a bigger compost. Yeah, go ahead. I've three poles in my garden the way it goes before I bought the house. What would be the best scenario? I cut them down, get rid of berries so they would not stop and, you know, invade them. All the hollies? The hollies, no. yeah. Hollies, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, if you can part with them and, and take them out, that would be, that would be great. Um, you know, yeah, it would be good, it would be good to see because we, we really do need to start getting rid of these holly trees. Um, yeah, that would be great. Possible. But I guess being in the city though, you, you probably need to get a tree permit for that. So you probably want to talk to your equipment folks to see if that's okay or where they stand on that. I'm not sure what equipment stands on that, but maybe someone from equipment can answer that one. All the trees. Has to be like more than seven inches in diameter or something like So that. even if it is considered an invasive species and it's but it's large enough, you, you, you've got to get a permit for that, right? Or they won't allow they won't allow it. Together, uh, these are a bit different, of course. But but so I think if you're, 
I think the natural way to go with it is better. If you have bits of rotting wood, you know, there, you can have all kinds of different bees drilling into those or standing posts, things like that, rather than going with traditional um, key hotels and that. Yeah, yeah. And just one more comment about, um, you know, now that we're in this climate change thing and fire is a bigger danger than it has been, yeah. um, you know, in our communities, um, I wonder if it still has was an idea to have those, um, those vegetative <coughs> branches and a lot of dead varieties hanging around, yeah. or Yeah, exactly. yeah it, it's it's challenging. It's challenging, you know. Um, yeah, a lot of people, you know, would no longer recommend having an evergreen, like a, a carnivorous hedge, you know, anywhere near your house. And that's, that might be a good idea. Um, it's a little different, though. Like we're talking about the interface with, you know, people who live in the countryside and they have a house in the middle of the forest. There's different concerns there, for sure. Um, yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah, and, and, and you've got to be fire smart there. I mean, there, there's yeah. If you don't have plants planted right up close to your trees, planted right up close to your house, um, especially conifer trees, yeah, it, it's challenging. You know, you, you, you want to have some big shade trees. You don't want to have a, a yard with it that doesn't have the trees in it. But um, I don't think there's any easy solutions around that one. I think in Port Coquitlam, there are some bylaws that you can't have plants over a certain height, like right at the front of the yard along the curb. Can you recommend some ground covers that would be fairly hardy for along the um, roadside? Um, yeah, roadside can be tough areas, especially the sidewalks. If you've got a lot of sun and a lot of heat, um, there is kinnikinnik, you know, the bear berry. We can talk about that uh, tonight, but it's a good, tough, uh, tough, tough one. There's uh, one of the cultivars that does very well is the Vancouver Jade. Um, it's one you can try and plant. So, uh, so yeah, that one works. Um, what other? Um, I mean, there's. I mean, they have Genista pilosa as well. Um, that's very well. It's a ground cover, but I don't think it has much pollinator support. It. So, but the Canadian definitely does. Yeah, pretty even. In our neighborhood, there's probably like 20 or 25 houses that have the lawns where, as you said, with the shaper beetles and the turtles and dig it up, it gets completely turned over, and then those people seem to re, you know, sod it, and then it happens again a couple of years, and then they re sod it. How does one, like, diplomatically? <coughs> Done it three years in a row, and and I, I I talk to them all the time about it. You know, like, you know, I'm like Ron, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna turn this again. You know, um, I, I don't get it. I mean, I yeah, don't. So some... we should have been inviting them tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. Um, I think there has to be a even. I think there are campaigns about about that. I know one thing I find a little bit maybe a little bit distressing is for folks that I mean, talking about just leaving your lawn. To go yellow and golden, I think as somebody was saying, and that's really not dealing with the issue of the problem with lawns. I mean, I mean, they're just they're just so hard, artificial. They're not we're not meant to be growing lawns here. But um, yeah, it would be nice to see more education, more um, maybe, maybe even provincial government education now. You know, since since it's a since it's a big a big issue now. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard it's quite late today, although I have to share information about this event. And actually, it's been on Facebook, and there were 84 people who come from the Bay Commune, and 300 more who come from the Bay Inclusive Department, they were able to join. So, you have a wonderful presentation and video recorded if you would like to share it somehow on the video of the site. I'm sure many people will be reached, many more. Thank you so much for that. And we do have Tri Cities Community TV who is capturing footage tonight, so we'll be sure to share it with Coco and then up on our own Facebook pages as well. I know you're trying to encourage people away from the lawns, but when I had my grubs in my lawn, I did have some success, and I'm going to butcher this, but the dietitians are. Oh, are you familiar with that? Yep. I found it somewhat successful, and I was just calm, wanting to know if you had any knowledge on that. Toxicity of it that I might have missed, it seemed to be relatively 
so yeah. you're going to yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's these fossilized, very sharp little, you know, pin shaped things that, that are very good for piercing the bodies of grubs, right? Right. And, uh, yeah, that kills yeah, 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 exactly. Or they come up against it and, and it, you know, punctures their, their skin mm -hmm. as well. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I haven't, uh, I've heard of people using nematodes, uh, but, but, but you've got to be very particular with those. It's got to be the right temperature and the right timing. Yeah. And then you've got to keep your lawn moist to keep the nematodes alive. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So, what, so when did you apply it? Well, I was just thinking about the season, like when, when, season. yeah. Yeah, well, when I think the same too, the bugs tend to uh, come in late in June, specifically. Yeah, well, that's when you're actually going to build a lot of the needles, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. I haven't heard too much about that. No, you're aware of it? No, okay. I don't think so. It's pretty, okay. pretty good. Thank you, Zach. Um, I'm just wondering your thoughts on clover as a grass replacement. Yeah, uh, clover, my clover is being used quite a bit. Um, I, I like it. I, I like clover. Um, I, I think it's worth trying for sure. Uh, I don't think it's another nitrogen fixer as well. So, so it's healthy for the soil. Um, it's probably tougher than grass, a little more resilient, I think. Um, I would definitely go with clover. I think it's a, and of course, you let it flower, and you've got a good source of clover for pollinators to be So, yeah, I, I, I like that for sure. It's not really a question. It was almost responding. Um, a couple people were asking about how to educate landscapers. One of the things that might be interesting to do as an idea is to ask if they are SOUL accredited. SOUL is S-O-U-L, and that stands for Society for Urban Landscaping. It's a Canadian society. The, um, it's based in Ottawa. You pay to um, for accreditation. They have to take a test, and you need to renew this accredit this credit every year. And so it's a very well respected, um, uh, I should say, all I can think of is accreditation to add to a landscaper's kind of portfolio. And so to ask if they're that, then maybe the landscaper will look into well, what is that? And they can follow up and it focuses specifically on urban land care and from an organic and sustainable perspective. Yeah. It's, it's a good idea. Thanks everyone. Um, if there's a couple people who didn't get your questions answered, James and Nancy are here if you want to chat to them before you scoot out the door. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out this evening. We hope you enjoyed it.